Hello, I'm Helen Stalford and I'm Professor of Law and Finding Director of the European Children's Rights Unit at the University of Liverpool in the UK. It's a great pleasure to introduce this online series, which we've called Children in Theory, Theor Theoretical Methods and Approaches to the Study of Childhood. In the course of this series, our aim is to provide researchers of all levels with an opportunity to explore how key theoretical methods and approaches can be brought to bear on our research involving children. Theoretical approaches have been referred to by some scholars as the invisible protagonist in research relating to children, which has in recent decades at least, been largely dominated by qualitative participatory frameworks. But theoretical methods are as important as the empirical foundations of our research. And they're often overlooked or confined researchers, particularly those from disciplines that are not routinely taught to work with explicit theoretical methodologies. In reality, all research, all research questions are grounded in theory to different degrees, whether we acknowledge that or not. We all have different ways of seeing and understanding childhood, which frame the way that we design, conduct, analyze, and present our research. And if, importantly, the way that we understand childhood and children informs law, policy, and practice at different levels as well. Clarifying and consolidating our theoretical foundations can also act as a meeting point for research from diverse disciplinary traditions. We can establish common conceptual and ethical frameworks that foster more interconnected conversations across disciplines. Now, developing our knowledge of and confidence in applying different theories will equip us as researchers with new tools for assessing and explaining problems and for identifying potential solutions to them. But also it works in the other direction. We can optimize the potential of child related research to speak to, inform and develop these established theoretical frameworks. Now, we at the European Children's Rights Unit have brought together some of the most eminent experts from across the world to share their knowledge with us. They will present a series of short presentations that will introduce us to different theories. They'll identify some key resources to help develop our understanding of their, their different frameworks and help us to understand how to apply these to different contexts. They invite us as researchers to reflect on how these frameworks can be brought to bear on our own areas of study. And to assist this reflection, each presentation is followed by what we call an online conversation between the theory expert and a children and childhood researcher. And that will help us to illustrate how this theory can be applied to different areas of childhood research. Now, in line with our commitment to sharing our resources and nurturing capacity for childhood research of the highest quality, all of these materials are completely free of charge. They should be available to all researchers, no matter where you are and no matter what stage of your studies or your career that you're at. We'll release a new presentation every month or so, and we'll continue to build on them as new ideas and invitations emerge. So by the end of the first year, at least, we'll have a really good repository of what we hope to be useful resources. We hope that you will enjoy and benefit from them. Use them as, as, as you like. Use them in your individual work, in your work as a group, or to support your teaching. And please do share them widely with others and let us know what you think of them.
Welcome to our introductory session for the new series, Children in Theory, Theoretical Methods and Approaches for the Study of Childhood. My name is Deborah Lawson, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Liverpool and a member of the European Children's Rights Unit. I'm the facilitator for this introductory conversation with David Archard and John Wall. Hello to you both. Hi, hello. You're both very well placed to begin our conversation on theory and childhood, childhood research. By way of a brief introduction, David Archard is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Queen's University Belfast, Chair of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, and Honorary Vice President of the Society for Applied Philosophy. He's an applied moral philosopher. He's published widely on many topics, including the moral and political status of children, the family and sexual e ethics. John Wall is Professor of Philosophy, Religion and Childhood Studies, as well as Director of the Childism Institute at Rutgers University, Camden. He's a theoretical ethicist who works at political philosophy, post-structuralism and children's rights. He's authored a number of books concerning challenges to children's rights, their political rights and ethics in childhood. Welcome and thank you for joining me. So following Helen Stafford's introduction to the series, I have three questions for you both to get your views on the use of theoretical approaches in childhood research. My first question, what do you make of the current landscape of theoretical research on childhood or current theories which are used to study childhood? I'm gonna ask you, Dave, if you'd begin. Thanks very much, Deborah. So for me, uh, and I'm unashamedly an English speaking philosopher, the current landscape is incredibly rich and varied. Uh, when I published my book on children in 1993, there was no competing book, only a handful of published articles and one very good editor collection. Now there's an extraordinary wealth of published philosophical material on childhood. So a couple of years ago, Routledge published their handbook of the philosophy of childhood and children. And its sheer length and breadth is testimony to the change that's occurred. And interesting, the editors make the comment at the beginning of their book that childhood and children have until recently been a neglected topic. That's no longer the case. The issues in, in current philosophical work roughly conform to a threefold division that I followed in my own book, the moral and political status of the child, the child in the family and the child in the state. That seems to be relatively unchanged. However, whilst I think it's all great, if I have a complaint, it's that the work is very narrowly philosophical now. When I wrote my book, and perhaps because of the paucity of philosophical writing, I reference work in sociology, anthropology, history, law, and literature. Uh, equally, I try to trace what is actually quite a thin tradition of writing on children in the historical canon. So people like Aristotle, Locke and Rousseau, the current writing is resolutely contemporary in every sense, but that's where we are at the moment, I think. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, and I, I would, what I would highlight is the, the, the theoretical work that's been going on in childhood studies, um, which is a field that, began in the late 70s, really, and took, took off in the 80s as a, a, a reaction to developmental psychology for the most part. And uh, I see two or three different phases there. It started out as a, a movement coming of structuralism based in grounded in structuralism. So Marxism, Lacan, um, uh, and Bourdieu, uh, as well as uh, Anthony Giddens. And the idea was that children are uh, um, constructed um, beings. So they're constructed by their societies around them. And Foucault was part of that as well. Uh, but also their agents within those constructions and have, have their own agency. So we're not gonna look at them as pre-adults like a developmental psychologist might, um, or at least was accused of doing. Um, but increasingly there have been different forms of post-structural theory that, that have come into play in childhood studies, especially in the 2000s and even post-post-structuralist uh, ideas. So there I would include um, 
feminist forms of post-structuralism where there's a concept, there's, there's the, the desire to look at childhoods as relational, embodied um, expressions of difference, those kinds of things. Another big part of it is uh, post-colonialist theory and indigenous theories and global Southern theories that have tried to look at uh, power relations, marginalization, uh, Epistem epistemologies uh, that 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 prevent you from seeing children very well, especially in the global south. There are anti-racist uh, queer theory, um, you know, disability studies types of approaches to childhood as well. And then, you know, the, another big category I would put in there is a kind of a post-humanist uh, idea where um, children are are theorized not as just human but as much more than that and related to nature and the climate and 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 that sort of thing and and connected to that in some ways is a kind of this there's a new materialism happening that is trying to look at children's you know embodiment in a different kind of a way um and a critical realism uh, which is trying to connect constructivism to realism in in a way um but there is a third kind of element that that i seen and, and that I, I would count myself as being part of. So of course I'm always third because that, that's coming next. <laughs> but there's been a critical childhood studies movement, you could call it, um, where the effort has been to do more than borrow theory from other areas, um, but actually to develop childhood studies theory in and of itself, just as feminists and anti-racists and others have done. Uh, so um, sometimes that means political theory in an attempt to change politics uh, and norm normative assumptions from children's perspectives. There's been generations theory, which is attempt to look at the way in which different generations interact and change each other. There's interesting stuff like something called child prism research and child as method research that take the child as a prism or lens or microscope for looking at any social phenomenon. Uh, and, and then my own work is in childism, which is like feminism, uh, and it's an attempt to transform structures and norms through the experiences of children. Uh, so that's how I see the landscape at the moment unfolding. So this is quite a changing landscape, I think. Uh, it sounds pretty exciting. So on that note, what do you think the role is for theory? Um, in childhood research? Um, well, I would say there's a, there's a couple of different roles. Um, well, maybe three. One of, one of them is to empower researchers to be more critical in their work. So to, to understand the deeper issues, the, the, most, the, the underlying questions that might be asked and, and so on. Um, another one is that it provides language for child studies researchers and researchers of children to connect to other types of studies, uh, for example, uh, feminist studies or Marxist studies. And so it, it provides a language that, that doesn't, that prevents you from being isolated within just studies of children. And then the third um, uh, part of theory, I think, is to then speak back to those theories and it allows child, child researchers to, you know, to speak to philosophers, for example, or religious religion scholars or sociologists who, who might not think that dealing with children, but actually are, uh, even if they're not necessarily explicitly focused on children. Children, of course, are involved in every aspect of life, every aspect of society. Um, another example would be law, which actually was quite early in childhood studies, but but um, how, how theory can, can empower childhood studies scholars to speak to law and say, look, you know, um, you're actually dealing with children, even if you don't realize you are. Uh, just as, again, in the past, feminism allowed uh, gender studies and women's studies scholars to, to speak to lawyers and say, actually, a lot of this, you're kind of forgetting about this whole sector of people. Can I pass that over to you, Dave? Yes, thanks. So I, I think, again, I'm going to respond uh, wearing my philosophical hat um, and, and say that I do what most philosophers do, I hope, but 
in my case, do it in part in the case of, of children and childhood. So I think there are two uh, very inf- important functions or roles that the philosopher plays. One is simple, old-fashioned conceptual analysis. It's trying to make sense of concepts and understand why they're used and whether they should be used in certain kinds of ways. So clearly, one of the important pieces of work that's being done in philosophy of of childhood is trying to understand the concept of the child and to bring to bear on that analysis a lot of very familiar machinery within epistemology and uh, metaphysics and logic. So, for instance, in the book I wrote, uh, part of it was a critique of a very long-standing orthodox view that the concept of the child was a modern one, uh, and that borrowed from the famous work of Philippe Arrières, this French historian, arguing that people didn't have a concept of of childhood until roughly the end of the 18th century. And that seemed to me uh, to actually be false um, and actually based on rather poor reasoning, but it nevertheless was very influential. It was important to draw a distinction between a concept and a conception and try to show that the concept had been around for a long time, but there was a very distinctive modern conception of the child. Equally, I think that since I wrote the book, sociology of childhood has made enormous advances. And the sort of claims that that, that John was referencing there, that the, the concept that a child might be a constructed one, seems to be another important idea that it's worth examining and thinking about because it's a, a very familiar one to uh, philosophers who write on, on concepts. So that, that first role is one of conceptual analysis. Second role, it seems to me, is one of analyzing uh, moral arguments and uh, trying to make sense of the moral and political status of children. And here, there's a lot of very interesting recent work. We commit ourselves as moral and political philosophers to the moral equality of human beings, and then seem to have a real puzzle what we do with children who don't seem to be the equals of adults, both in the sense that they are treated as inferiors, but also that they possess rights that adults don't. So there's a lot of interesting work trying to make sense of how we combine those two claims of moral equality and differential treatment. Um, And obviously most centrally, and it's been the most interesting theme in philosophical writing is, do children have rights? By that I mean, I don't mean, do they have rights in law? Quite clearly they do, and there's the UN uh, convention, but are they morally entitled to have rights? And that is uh, a somewhat disputed subject in uh, moral theoretical writing on children. And even if we can agree that children do have rights, there's the other interesting question, well, what rights are those exactly? And why do they have the particular rights they do Uh, that adults don't, and vice versa. So those seem to be the two important roles, conceptual analysis and normative argument. Thank you both. Um, So there's some very interesting spaces to think about the role of the researcher there. Um, And it kind of brings me on to my third question. So how do we think theoretical work in the field of childhood research itself can contribute to or help advance broader theoretical work that isn't related to childhood? And I think that question touches on a couple of points you've raised already. Um, If I can pass that to you first, Dave. Sure. I think this is a a really interesting question and one I've puzzled about for a while. So, I mean, first of all, I think this is general question about what is historically and culturally specific about the way we think about things now and in this particular place. Um, and what is universally true and invariant across the ages. And if there are differences, which there may very well be, what does that actually tell us now about who we are and how we think about ourselves? So uh, in some ways, the whole problem of what is modernity uh, and what is post-modernity, what exactly does that mean? I think is interestingly thought about through the lens of childhood and children. Um, Secondly, there's an enormous amount that we say about human beings as philosophers, which actually is only true and of relevance to the case of adults. So if we do philosophical research on childhood, um, 
we learn a lot about adults and why we think they're uh, different uh, from children. Or in fact, we learn a lot about unspoken assumptions we make about adult human beings, which I think can then be usefully explored by contrasting them with uh, children. And I wanted to just mention three themes in which I think uh, uh, this is useful. The first is the whole puzzling uh, problem of paternalism, uh, the idea that it's totally wrong uh, to act in certain ways uh, to promote another person's good, to limit their freedom for their own good. But we think it's perfectly OK with children. So it's really interesting why we think uh, it's bad for adults and good for children and what that tells us about paternalism. Secondly, I know this is a topic of interest to John, the whole question of the suffrage and the vote or political equality. Why does it matter that we have the vote? Um, what is it about us that entitles us to vote and to participate in democracy? And why does that make democracy a good thing? And why in excluding children from the suffrage are we doing something that's okay? And thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, the whole question of equality in general, um, the moral equality of human beings sits in odd tension with the different ways we treat children from adults. Um, and that, I think, uh, is something that needs to be explored further and as yet is not particularly resolved. Um, I would like to end by saying that, like quite a few philosophers, I really passionately believe in the role of literature. And I think beyond theory, it's really useful to read what uh, literature tells us about uh, children and the different views we can take on children across the ages in different novel forms. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting when you look back at uh, philosophical as well as poetic, uh, religious and, and novelistic and aesthetic uh, 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 interpretations of children. Um, in history, because what you find, what I found, and one of the things that actually got me interested in childhood studies initially is that often um, adult concepts are being applied to children, but every once in a while, children's own experiences challenge what's meant, what's thought of as human nature and, and provide profound um, critiques of, of, of assumptions about human nature and just to give very, one very brief example, which I know Dave will be very familiar with, um, you know, John Locke's empiricism, which is the groundwork for all social sciences and sciences today, was in fact grounded in large part in his understanding of babies as mm. coming into the world without knowledge. Um, they come in as sort of pace, uh, blanks, not blank slates, but blank pages or pieces of wax or something like that. And you, you start thinking by, first of all, collecting sensory experience and then adding concepts afterwards. And that's, that's what his entire theory of empiricism was based on. And that's an example where he was able to, to break through pri prior adultistic ideas and come up with new ideas. Now, there's a lot of problems I have with John Locke, but in that particular instance, it was interesting. So I think that, you know, the, the question of, what does childhood research have to contribute um, also involves a question of thinking in new ways or opening up new questions or doing that, doing the kinds of things that anti-racist theory, post-colonial theory, feminist theory and disability theory have also, have also done. And considering the fact that children are a third of the global population, which is there's as many children as there are women or men in the world, it's, it's actually probably a very large uh, uh, task. Um, and, and I think we live in peculiarly adultist times and I blame modernity for that because I think we came to value the individual rational, supposedly competent actor above anything else. And um, there've been many types of critique of that, but there hasn't so far in the larger academy or in, a, or in society been a a broader critique of that adultism. That, and that, that's a big job that ch childhood studies scholars, philosophers, and others ha have to do in, in the decades to come. Um, so and there's one reason why I think voting is so important to think about. You know, it's, it's not just a matter of thinking, well, how do children, should children get the same vote that adults now have, but actually to recognize that as other groups have gained suffrage over history, the very concept of voting has changed radically. 
you know, from when it was just landowners, for example, you know, we, we think about it very differently today than we did in the past. And do we need to think about it in a new way in the future uh, in that way? So, you know, I think, I think childhood research has, has these kind of jobs. I, I think I would say there's three main jobs. Um, one of them is to impact and make other scholars and people in society and politicians think differently than they've been thinking because children are marginalized in many different ways. In many ways they're not, but in many ways they are as children. Um, I think to highlight the simple existence of children in some ways is part of that. That's the second thing I point to is just the fact that children have particularity. They're not just mini adults as generally thought. They're not just, or pre-adults. Um, they have their own dignity. They, they have their own distinctiveness and difference of experience that needs to be respected. And there's great diversity among childhoods around the world. I mean, many children, for example, work and need to work for their families. And, and yet in the global North, that's viewed as, as something to be done away with, you know. And then finally, I'll just say, you know, coming up with new concepts. Uh, you know, feminists have come up with new concepts of relationality and embodiment and so on. But what, what, would, what would a childist come up with? You know, what would a childhood studies scholar or a philosopher come up with that no one's thought of before? And I think philosophy has that creative uh, element that it needs to embrace and come up with new ideas about interdependence or temporality or um, narrativity or embodiment or whatever it is that, that will help make children more visible uh, to, to us and to others as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Those are my three questions for you. So uh, I, it's really interesting to think about some of those changing landscapes and some of the roles that researchers can begin to play. Um, I think John mentioned it. it's, it's big John. <laughs> um, but some of those spaces where uh, early career researchers and, and researchers currently working on childhood and children's rights um, can start to navigate some of these ideas. Um, so this series hopefully will be um, of considerable to support for some people to start to think about theoretical spaces. But thank you so much um, for beginning this journey with us. Um, thank you. Thank you.